Hello, my name is Jamie Lemke. I'm a senior research fellow and associate director of academic and student programs at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. I'm here with my colleague, friend, and former professor, Chris Coyne. Chris Coyne is a professor of economics and the director of graduate studies at George Mason University. He is also the associate director of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center. His most recent book is Doing Bad by Doing Good, Why Humanitarian Action Fails. Um, Chris is here to talk with me a little bit about Austrian economics today. So thank you for coming in, Chris. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Maybe you can just start by telling us a little bit about what Austrian economics is. Well, Austrian economics as a school of thought refers to um, the tradition that really began in the late 1870s. Uh, and it's traced back to Karl Menger, who published his book, Principles of Economics, in 1871. And Menger was one of the uh, one of three founders of what today we call the Marginal Revolution, which was a, a paradigm shift in, in economics, uh, where economists moved from focusing on the labor theory of value to subjective value uh, and the role that that played in um, individual decision making. Uh, and then from Menger, you have uh, Eugen von Bavrik and Fred Frederick von Wieser, uh, who followed him, and then, and then up to Mises, Hayek, and more modern-day Austrians um, like Israel Kirzner, Murray Rothbard, and, and Ludwig Lachmann. Can you say a little bit more about that transition from a labor theory of value and more objective conception to the subjective? Well, at, prior to the Marginal Revolution, the standard um, kind of consensus around how economists or political economists viewed value was that the value of a good or service was dependent on the amount of, of effort or labor that went into either producing or securing um, that good or service. Uh, and what Menger emphasized, uh, as well as the others in, uh, in, in the other two founders of the Marginal Revolution, but especially Menger, was that value was not some objective function uh, or inherent in the good or service itself, but rather was dependent on the uh, value attributed to it by other individuals. Uh, that is, it was in the mind of the actor. And so if you think about it, um, you or I or, or someone else might invest significant amounts of, of labor, resources, and, and effort in producing something. But less consumers, that is, other individuals, value it highly, uh, irregardless of how much we invest, um, they will not purchase it or, or be willing to exchange a high amount of, of goods or resources to secure that good or service. And that's really what, in, in a fundamental sense, what it was all about. Subjectivism, um, and, and what some people like Kersner call radical subjectivism or, or, or radical ignorance later on, um, which is related to that, um, is a, a hallmark of, of the Austrian school. One of the issues where the Austrian school really came to prominence was in the 1920s and the 1930s, the debate over uh, the ability of people to be able to calculate and make economic decisions in the absence of a price system, a market system. Can you talk a little bit about the Austrian school's role in those debates? What today we call the economic cal calculation debate really started in the early 1900s. And the debate was a purely technical one, that is, a, a pure debate over economic theory. And on the one side, as the name of the debate implies, there was the socialists who wanted to nationalize the means of production. That is, in its original form, they wanted the argument was that they wanted to completely eradicate private property and the unit of exchange, so money. Um, and the, the argument was that um, in doing so, they could rationally plan economic activity such that you would either equal or outproduce what capitalism could produce. Capitalism, of course, being defined as, as the private um, ownership over the means of production. So the socialists argued that they could either equal production or, or outproduce in terms of material wealth what capitalism could do, uh, but also at the same time overcome a variety of the ills of capitalism, so things like inequality, um, unemployment, business cycles, and so on down the line. Uh, what Mises and then and Hayek came in and argued is that absent private property rights over the means of production, you would not be able to have exchange because you can't exchange things you don't own. Absent exchange ratios, um, which emerge out of exchange, by exchange ratios I mean prices, there is no way for economic actors to gauge the relative value of alternative resource uses. In other words, there is no way for economic actors to gauge the opportunity cost of using resources um, in, in one line of activity as compared to another line of activity, all of which are technologically feasible. Um, so, uh, you know, Mises, for instance, 
one of the things he said, to, to paraphrase him, is that planners wouldn't know if they should use platinum to make railroad tracks or to use it in jewelry, for instance. The reason we know how to use it is because producers of railroad tracks know it's too expensive to be used in that, um, in that line of uh, production. And the reason they know that is because of the price of it. Those prices are traced back to exchange. And so that's really the core of the debate. It ties directly back into that initial insight about subjectivism. That That's Manker exactly makes right. in the in the marginal revolution. So you have what might seem like a relatively abstract or theoretical exercise, this conversation about the origins of value, subjective or objective, that turns out to have these massive real world stakes because you're talking about these grand social experiments in places like the Soviet Union. That's right. And so really what this all comes down to at its very core is really the wealth and poverty of nations. That is what allows a society or prevents members of a society from figuring out how to best use scarce resources to produce goods and services that they and other consumers value. That's really what, in some sense, what economics is, is about, but also what economic development in the broadest sense is about. Uh, and so th this debate, um, which again, many people simply um, kind of think of as a history of thought uh, episode, which it was, and it's important to on, on purely those grounds, but it also has uh, a lot of relevance, real-world relevance, as you pointed out, uh, even today.